Best Book Bits podcast brings you Mike Irwin, Executive Director of Team Red, White and Blue, and the CEO of the Character and Leadership Center, where he's worked with organizations including Walmart, PwC, Amazon, Special Force Units, and the Boston Celtics. Mike graduated from West Point and served on active duty in the U.S. Army for 13 years, including three deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan, and continues to serve as a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army Reserve. Mike earned a master's degree in positive psychology and leadership at the University of Michigan and co and with the co-founder of Positive Psychology, Dr. Chris Peterson. He's also the co-founder of The Positivity Project, a character education organization that employs America's youth to build positive relationships. He's the author of Lead Yourself First and Leadership is a Relationship. Mike lives with his family on a 32-acre homestead outside Fort Bragg, New Car- North Carolina. Mike, thanks for being on the show. Hey, great to be here, Michael. Fired up to get into the conversation today. Yeah, awesome. Now, we'll unpack everything that I just touched on. Massive life resume you've got there. But first, tell me about your 32-acre uh, homestead. I'm slightly jealous. What fun do you get up to on the homestead? Yeah, it's, it's been such a learning experience. I'm 42 years old and had spent the first 40 years of my life really you know, kind of living like in you know, cities or neighborhoods or villages. And uh, my wife and I joke, we both had a midlife crisis at age 40 and we made the decision to move out to, you know, to land. It's been eye-opening. Um, one, how challenging it is, whether you're talking and we've got you know, a vegetable garden, orchard, beehives, greenhouse, and then we also raise pigs, chickens, ducks, goats, uh, and soon beef cattle. And so we dabble in like a little bit of everything. So you would, you know, call it a homestead, but it, it's been so interesting to, to learn. And I've, and I've learned a lot about leadership and about a lot about life just from my experience out here. So much of it is like, you've got to roll your sleeves up and do it. You know, you can read about it. You can watch YouTube videos and study it. And, and sometimes like when you're learning how to process a chicken, you just got to learn how to do it and, and get reps. And, and so it's been fascinating for me and so many different levels to be humbled by shoveling pig poop uh, to, you know, to learning how, what mistakes you made that allowed a lot of your turkeys to die. So it's been a very rewarding and enriching, but also very challenging and adversity filled period of time uh, since moving out here. Yeah, awesome. And you've got, uh, I know you've got a few kids. How many kids do you have? We do, yeah. So uh, my wife and I, we got five kids. So they're uh, uh, basically two, six, eight, 10, and 12. So yeah, they're they're of the age that they're, a lot of them are starting to become more helpful around the farm. But yeah, and my wife, you know, we homeschool. My wife uh, is a former teacher. And so we do a lot of our learning, a lot of our teaching here on the farm, whether it be science or you know, learning other things. So it, it's really exciting. And, and every day is just, you never know what you're going to get here on the farm. Now, take us back to graduating from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point with a Bachelor of Science degree in economics in 2002. Talk about your military career and how that sort of all unfolded. Absolutely. So my grandfather served in World War II. My other grandfather was a firefighter. And so that's some of where the lineage of public service comes from in my family. But I started attending West Point in 1998, which means that the, the terrorist attacks of 2001 on September 11th took place 45 miles down the river from where I was at at West Point and at the start of my senior year. So it changed everything. It just rapidly uh, made things more serious because we knew there was a good chance that you know, we would you know, be called to go to war. So I went on and served 13 years on active duty, and, uh, but it really started there at West Point. And and when I and I was an intelligence officer, uh, deployed with and, and served alongside NATO forces like the British and the Australians and the Canadians and the Romanians. Um, so it was great not just doing intel work, but also doing work in conjunction and partnership with with other uh, of our uh, allies. So you know, for me as an intelligence officer, my number one responsibility was not to tell the past and to tell the commander what had just happened but to try to analyze what happened and the current reports of intelligence and to predict as accurately as possible what the insurgency, what the enemy was going to do next so that we could then make, think about like a, you know, a game on a chessboard so that we could then make certain moves to be prepared for whatever the insurgency would do next. So that was my job. And you know, without jumping too far ahead into the conversation around entrepreneurship and leadership, but you know, it really gave me these, these skill sets of being a forward thinker, of being predictive in my analysis that would be very helpful to an entrepreneur like myself. But 
you know, bringing it back to the military, as you mentioned, three deployments, Iraq once, Afghanistan twice. Um, and it really was a, in basically my 20s, so I, like 23 to 30 is, is when this happened. And I couldn't really have asked like for more formative, uh, more challenging, but more life-changing experiences than, than what I got in my 20s. And it really laid the foundation that would impact me for the rest of, the rest of my leadership life. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thanks for unpacking and we'll sort of touch on some of the stories if you want a little bit later. Sort of following your third deployment, you attended the University of Michigan from 2009 to 2011. You earned a master's degree in positive psychology and leadership under the tutelage of uh, co-founder of positive psychology, Dr. Chris Peterson. Uh, what was that experience like uh, going back to um, university? Oh, uh, unbelievable. Yeah, it was. So first of all, I was very much like a fish out of water. Um, most of the people that I was in the PhD program with were 23 or 24. I was a full, you know, five, six, seven years older than them. Plus just the amount that I had experienced and seen in my twenties, right. I was probably from a maturity standpoint, probably more like 35 or 40, just in terms of all that I had gone through. So that was, that was one thing, but the chance to study under, uh, Chris Peterson, uh, was just incredible. Um, the, the guy was so gracious with his time. He was so thoughtful about how to mentor and guide me. He knew that he didn't really know much about my, my life journey other than, you know, that I was in the military and had come right out of a, a deployment to Afghanistan. And to study under someone who had spent, you know, his entire career basically studying and learning and building this field of positive psychology and prior to that in the field of clinical psychology, it was a real gift. Um, and it was because he allowed me to be like a normal graduate student. Because I was not a normal graduate student, not just because I was older. I was also in the army. I was still an active duty captain in the army, and so he was like, "Geez, how do I interact with him?" Because he's different. Like you know, usually I'm working with 23 or 24 year olds, right, who are you know don't have a job, right, and and they're trying to figure out like what they're going to do with the rest of their lives. Here's a guy who's who knows exactly what he's doing next. After he leaves here, he's going back to his alma mater at West Point, and he's going to teach psychology and leadership. Uh, and so he really did a great job at just allowing me to, to, to find my own way. And I'm forever grateful for that because it allowed me to create Team Red, White, and Blue and to start working on both books, right, that would eventually uh, seven and 11 years later become published. Uh, and so him as a mentor in my life was was transformational. Yeah, that's nice. Looking back, you can connect the dots and really see the people that were there to help you and guide you to the next level. Talk to me about founding Tem, Team Red, White and Blue. What's it about and, and when did you start this? So Team Red, White and Blue is a national 501c3 nonprofit organization, non-governmental organization. And our mission is to enrich veterans' lives. And we do that by forging the leading health and wellness community for veterans all across the nation. We are actually 12 years old as of tomorrow, uh, you know, and so that's, that's a, something you know, to be proud of because a lot of times organizations don't make it that long. Um, lots of times, you know, uh, you might even make it and have a good first five years, but then something changes. So we've had to evolve like any organization, business or nonprofit, doesn't matter. You know, we have evolved um, in what started out as an organization that was primarily focused on helping military veterans transition from active duty to civilian life and then to reintegrate into that civilian world because we were seeing lots of veterans come home from deployments from iraq and afghanistan and all over the world and they were really struggling when they would leave the military behind and that's what we were really critical uh, you know critically needed to do in those first five six uh, seven years of the organization but over the past couple of years and accelerated by covid like we have really increasingly started to focus on health and well-being for veterans. And that means, yes, relationships with other people in your community, connection to other people, but also really tapping into the power of that physical activity. And knowing that physical activity doesn't just benefit you physically, also mentally and emotionally. And so we are really reminding veterans that being physically active is one of the most important things that they can do to invest in themselves and to invest in their health. Because when you are on active duty, the military makes you exercise five days a week. That's, that's a part of your job description. You have to pass physical fitness tests. And when you leave the military, that requirement goes away. And so that's challenging because for a lot of veterans, they say, hey, whew, I'm, I'm thankful to, to be gone. 
I don't need to wake up at 5.45 in the morning to go exercise from 6.30 to 7.30, Monday through Friday. And like they're happy to leave it behind. And while I say to them, that's okay to do that for a little bit, don't do that for too long because the effects are not just on your body that show up in the form of aches and pains and things like that. It's also on your mindset and on your mood. Yeah, I can really agree with that. Before COVID, I was in shape, doing good, working out five days a week. And then obviously the lethargy sets in and you're sort of going from weeks without working out to one or two days. And yeah, as you said, the mental... It's more the mental health that follows the, the physical activity, which is so important and people don't realize you've got to push your body to a point where, yeah, you start feeling better as well mentally. But yeah, moving on, you, you've done so much in your uh, life resume so far. What came next? Was it the uh, Character and Leadership Center? When was that founded? And Yeah, absolutely. So, so when I transitioned from grad school in 2011, so I graduated with my master's degree, I then returned back to West Point. Uh, this time I got promoted. I was a major in the army and I taught leadership and psychology. So all the while, I was also leading Team Red, White, and Blue, but it was really a side project. And that side project started to gain so much momentum that by 2000 and late 2012, we had to hire our first employee because we had generated enough money to do that. And then we hired our second employee. And then I stepped back and I really was the chairman of the board. Um, but uh, I finished up my time in the Army on active duty in 2015. And, and that's when I really founded uh, the next two organizations, the Character and Leadership Center, and uh, I co-founded the Positivity Project with uh, one of my friends from West Point, a guy named Jeff Bryan. He was two years behind me. Um, that started in 2015, and the Character and Leadership Center really started at about the same time. Uh, is really my the vessel and the the framework that I use to be able to talk about leadership to people, and and really it sums up in the in the titles of the two books that I've co-authored. But you need to be able to lead yourself first so that you can lead other people well, right? To build relationships with them, to forge connection. Um, and so that one-two punch of lead yourself first so that you can lead others is the framework of the Character and Leadership Center. And so, yeah, that work there started also in 2015 as I transitioned out from active duty to the reason. Yeah, and we'll jump into the uh, books in a second with the Positivity Project for people that don't understand what that is. It's a mission to empower America's youth to build positive relationships and become their best selves. Partnered with over 745 schools, which reaches over 400,000 children daily. Quite an achievement, so congratulations. That's that, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's it's been quite the journey. Um, you know, as you look at just the state of, especially coming out of COVID right now, uh, the social and emotional learning challenges that a lot of students have and again, not be able to read people's facial expressions because of their masks and um, like the lack of in-person interaction. So being able to teach students to be able to see the good in themselves, but also to recognize and see the good in other people, uh, I would argue is, is about as critical today as it's ever been. And so that, that helps to explain the rapid growth in really just, you know, five, six years from one school to, you know, now we're approaching 800 schools. Yeah, well, let's jump into the book. First off, I love this quote you write. You write, relationships are essential to our well-being and happiness. Strive to create a life where people who push you the hardest are the same people who care about you the most. Do you want to expand on that? That's a really, really fantastic quote. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think that we often, when we think about relationships, are based upon our experiences, our mind can go in multiple directions. We can think about some of the greatest relationships we have with family, friends, teammates, coworkers. And we also think about some of the worst and some of the worst experiences that we have. And inevitably, like we're human. And so we're going to have a, a constellation of relationship experiences. But I do think that sometimes uh, a lot of people think about relationships as being very much like in, in the warm and fuzzy and like the, the loving way. Um, and, and I go back to this quote, if you've ever heard of the book and the talk by a, a guy named Dr. Randy Pausch, you know, called The Last Lecture. You know, he passed away. He was dying of pancreatic cancer. And he made a really emphatic point in there that uh, one of his assistant coaches pulled him over and said, hey, I, I, know the, I know the head coach is really hard on you in football practice today. You know, but you know what? Like he's doing that because he loves you. If he didn't, if he didn't love you, he would not, he would not care. He would not, he would just would sit there and be more laid back and just like, you know, say a few things here and there. So it's that whole idea that it's amazing when we can find those people in our lives, the ones who love us the most are also the ones who push us the hardest and hold us accountable and tell us the things that we may not want to hear. Right. And that might be our spouse. That might be, 
you know, our sibling or our parent or our child or whoever it is, somebody that we're really close with, but they know us well enough and they're, they love us deeply enough that they are willing to lean in and, and, to, and to say those things that need to be said, right? And, and that relationships are not all about like sunshine and rainbows and everything's good all the time, right? Um, it really is about how do we hold one another accountable? How do we really push one another to, to maximize their potential and to be the very best that they can? Yeah, yeah, well said. And uh, just re circling back to the last lecture, I actually watched that two months ago by that guy named Randy. And yeah, before he died, yeah, he gave that last lecture. And it was funny and comical and it was really, really cool. And it was really nice what he did. And yeah, it's that's interesting that you said that because... Yeah, two months ago, I stumbled across that and uh, and watched that. So for people out there, just Google the last lecture on YouTube and uh, watch it. Yeah, moving through to the book. So the first one, Lead Yourself First, Inspiring Leadership Through Solitude. You write a little quote by C.S. Lewis who says, We live, in fact, in an age of in an age starved for solitude. Can you talk to me about the importance it is for leaders to, to go into solitude? Yeah, so and that quote, I mean, I think, Obviously, you said that a long time ago, but it's it's even more applicable today than ever. I think deep down, most people really do want more solitude in their lives. They want more peace and tranquility and quiet and a chance to look inward and contemplate their life and be introspective. And I think that most of them don't give themselves permission to do that or don't make it a big enough priority because of all the things that need to get done, all the busyness, all the tasks, all the emails, the push notifications, the text messages, the phone calls, the, you know, the social media, like all of it. <laughs> There's so much of it. And, and, and it really just robs uh, our ability to find that peace for, for most of us. You know? And so in the book, we really make and we try to build the case through these primarily historical examples but also through examples of contemporary leaders that says, look, they're like, these are examples of how leaders have successfully tapped into the power of solitude. And we try to inspire them, the reader, to then make solitude a priority in their life. It, we, we, I, we, Ray and I, my co-author, we didn't, we figured it, we're not going to sit here and like lecture people on like, hey, put your phones down, you know, stop reading, you know, answering emails all day long. You know, but we said, like, let's try to inspire people through some of these stories so that they can put the book down, both inspired, but also convinced that they should make this a priority in their life. And, you know, I think we did that. When you look through the, the ebb and the flow of the book, you can find just deeply inspiring stories that really illustrate why leaders and all, and, and all of us, but especially when we're in leadership situations, should tap into the incredible power of solitude, which we define as the mind isolated from the inputs from other minds. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and you also talk about, yeah, it's a subjective state of mind as well. And what you said, yeah, the mind isolated from the input of other minds works through a problem on its own as well. You, you talk a lot about the stories in the book as well. One of your stories is you chose to walk rather than ride each day to the chow hall, uh, which is a mile each way twice a day in temperatures in 100 degrees. You know, why did you do that? And uh, what did you get out of that as well with uh, gathering your thoughts? It happened initially out of need because like we, we had like a gator that would drive us because we were like quite a, you know, quite a, uh, a ways away on uh, Camp Taji from the dining facility. And so we had to walk. So if you wanted food, you had to walk, right? Or you had to convince somebody, you know, to, to pick up food for you. But then that was not good. So it started out as, as a necessity. Um, but then even after the vehicle got fixed, uh, I found that in those moments of town, uh, moments of time that I really kind of found myself and, and I would on the walk over, I'd think I'd, I'd pray. Uh, I'd unpack the ideas in my mind that I had just read about in the reports. And it gave me this time away from the computer, away from other people to just go inward and tap into my own mind, into my own thoughts. And uh, again, I didn't seek it out intentionally, but when I first started working on this book with Ray, I quickly recalled just how important those moments of each day were. And, and I just realized, and then he said, geez, well, it's interesting you're saying that. Well, me too. Like when I go you know, up north to my cabin to write my most important opinions and have my most important like leadership decisions, uh, Ray would say he's 10 to 15 IQ points smarter uh, up in Northern Michigan than, than down in the city. And so we both started talking to more and more people. And it just, it, it seems like a resounding theme that, Yes, I did my best thinking. I was the clearest. I was at my best 
uh, it was critical for my functioning for me to find those moments of solitude in my life. And so that's when we, we committed to working together and we, and really it took us six years until the book got picked up one additional year after that, until it was published by Bloomsbury press. Uh, and so it was quite the journey of perseverance, but we were, you know, and we, we remain truly convicted to the book's thesis really from the beginning in 2010. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for, for sharing that. And I see a theme, I speak to a lot of authors and read a lot of books. And one of the things about solitude, it's very closely related to getting clarity and it's all about getting clear in your head and, and sort of dumping what's, what's in your head to get clean as well. So you can move on with and, and processing. There's a quote out there that say the only reason, well, there's science, science says the only reason why we sleep is for memory consolidation. That's the only way they can put it down. And what that means is to basically defrag the C drive to move on to the next day. So that's scientifically proven that the only reason why we sleep is to, you know, consolidate sort of memories and, and put that into place. Moving on, you, you talk about, you know, if genuine leadership means taking the hardest path. And of, of course, solitude in a sense for leadership is very hard work. Moving on, you talk about clarity in the book and you talk about a story of Dwight Eisenhower, how he was made a leader in the decision to sort of launch D-Day invasion in June 6, 1944. Do you want to expand on that and talk about how Clarity led him to sort of make that decision two weeks sort of two weeks earlier than they thought he should? Yeah, absolutely. Such a fascinating story. First, when you study Eisenhower, there's a couple of great stories in there of how he demonstrated the power of slowing down to think before making decisions, how he would journal to himself and get his ideas out of his head down on paper course you know as an author like you know like that that it's a deeply uh embedded in solitude process to write you know you can't write when you're distracted you know you might be able to like write back an email but you can't write like thoughtful deep things you know when, when you're not uh in solitude but it was amazing to see how he did i mean yeah he had a lot of noise right he was a big extrovert he was put into position because he was political he did a good job of building relationships and listening to other field generals and generals from different countries. And as a Supreme Allied commander, his job was to make sure they were, they were all heard. But then in this particular case, especially he had to make a decision and he knew that his decision in many ways, the fate of the free world rest upon the decision and the successful uh, reclaiming of France um, in 1944. And so, you know, there he, all kinds of factors to, to take into consideration about you know, the, the, the tide and, and how far out like the obstacles were going to be and the moonlight, how much moonlight was there and the wind and the weather and what other countries and their leaders recommended and wanted and how many troops did you need to launch? I mean, he had all of these factors that were, uh, that he needed to consider and a lot of them were clouding his judgment. And so there's this one great moment that's written about him in his book where he like was just overwhelmed by all the ideas and the inputs and the advice from all these other people. And he just stepped away for about 10 minutes and just like looked out into, I believe it was the, Eng the English channel towards the Atlantic ocean and just sat there and thought, right. And just thought and thought and like, and, and he, he, in that moment of solitude, again, it wasn't going out to nature for a, a, a week or even a day, what, not even an hour. It was, it was like 10 minutes or so is, is what the biography says. And in that 10 minutes, he was able to gain the clarity of, no, we need to go. We need to launch on June 6th. Uh, all these men, these young soldiers who are most of them 18 years old, get ready to go across. Like we can't keep them over here for two more weeks. They've already been here knowing there's a, a very likely chance that they'll be going, you know, you know, to their death or to be injured. Um, and we're ready. Like, and they're ready and we, and we need to make this a five division assault. Uh, assault. And so all the decisions that he made, he achieved that clarity and like things crystallized and solidified in those moments of solitude. And so it was really just an example to any leader. Uh, luckily, it's very unlikely that you're making decisions on the caliber of, of you know, General Eisenhower that affects people's literally their lives, like are they going to live or die? Um, yet we all are making decisions that do affect and impact people's lives. And we should not take that lightly. And that we as leaders need to be willing to do that hard thinking and that analytical work to ensure that we're making the best decisions for the people that we lead and for the ripple effect of everything that flows from the effects of that decision. Yeah, harrowing story. I read that in the book. And yeah, obviously we don't, we're not charged with people's life every day in our day-to-day -day life, but definitely we can take some advice out of that as well. You talk about a guy named Fick, CEO of Endgame in the book, uh, a firm specialized in cyber 
uh, threat defences. He tells his assistant he needs 90 minutes a day on his calendar to close the door and to think. Two days each month with no meetings. How important is it to like schedule time to do nothing but think and to tinker as well? As men, we're, we're born to tinker and think, but how important is this to schedule in time to do this? Yeah, I mean, I believe it's, it's absolutely essential. And for, it's gonna be different based upon your the constraints of your environment, your reality, your personality. So we know that people who are more introverted by nature, um, they may find this easier, right? And they may find it more compelling that they need to really engage you know, deeply in solitude. Uh, you know, whereas extroverts like myself, sometimes like I've got to really push myself and schedule it and carve it out. Uh, but I think it's, it's essential that when you think about us as, as human beings, it's really only the past, you know, 20 years or so. It's really what we define as the information age starting in 2005 in the book. It's really only of these past 20 years where we've really had this bombardment of disruptions and in, in interactions that are nonstop, right? Because of email, because of phone, because of text message, social media, all the mediums at which we're accessible. Like this is, this is a recent phenomenon. You know, this is not like it's been like 50, 60 years, let alone a hundred years. So we are really, our brains and I think even our bodies are primarily you know, programmed and hardwired and created to crave time to just be, to be still, to think, to reflect, to analyze. And, um, you know, I think especially as a leader, when you're making decisions, because one of the biggest things leaders do is make decisions. When you are making decisions that impact other people's lives and their health and their livelihood, then again, you owe it to them to not just go through the motions and make the most expedient decision, but actually to do the work and say, is there a better way? Is there a different way? And again, I don't believe that you get there unless you're taking that time for solitude and thought and reflection. You cannot just outsource it to consultants or to your staff and just say, hey, tell me what I should decide. And I'll just choose one, two, or three based upon what I think makes the most sense. It's really an obligation to do some of that hard critical thinking yourself. Yeah, it also gives time for your brain to process things subconsciously and let your intuition come through. We're, we're so busy in our lives that we never spend the time for our true intuition. We never can listen to it as well. So having that solitude gives you clarity and also makes you listen internally to think about what that, that right thing you're, or what your subconscious or intuition is trying to tell you where most of the time we're, we're just so busy, so busy, busy, busy that we never have the time to actually think. One thing you write in the book, you talk about uh, gaining self-awareness through physical adversity. And a quote in the book, you talk about suffering throws open the door. Physical suffering strips you down to the bare fundamentals. It humbles you. You can't hide from it. You have to decide who you are and what you're going to do. Talk about that a little bit. Physical adversity leads to self-awareness. Very much a principle learned in the military, starting with West Point, that physical activity is really not about the physical effect on your body. It's really about the effect on your mind. And when you try to talk about self-awareness and being aware of who you are, um, a lot of times there's a lot of decisions that we've made and a lot of like thoughts dancing around in our brain that can cloud our self-awareness. And, you know, just, you know, this phrase to suffer is to discover, um, right? When you go through and you're doing like a 50 mile race, and I've done a whole bunch of these ultra marathons and, you know, you know uh, General Mattis talks about this in, in the portion of the book about, about doing hard physical things. It does, it strips you down because now whatever was like running around in your brain, you, you know, preventing you from gaining that true deeper sense of self-awareness is gone. That, that barrier to protection is not there. And so it really pushes you uh, into a deeper sense of self-awareness about who you are and what you want to do. And so uh, I absolutely believe in the linkage between physical activity and, and, and pushing yourself and self-awareness. And, and again, most of that comes through solitude, especially when you're doing long runs or rides or ruckus or hikes or whatever it is that you're doing on your own, whether you're on the rower or the Jacob's ladder, any of these pieces of equipment, and you're doing it on a loan, you really get to a place where 
you know, your sense of self-awareness of who you are grows um, in some of those more challenging times. Yeah, I think the problem with life is people don't put themselves through challenging situations and they never sort of meet who they really are or get down to the core of their self and, and become aware that there's a lot more in them than they realize as well. You talk about General Mateus in the book as well. He actually, is it true he carries around a thousand book library wherever he goes, wherever he's stationed as well. Is that correct? Yeah, so we talked to him about that. His nickname was like the Warrior Monk, um, you know. And eventually, he stopped moving, and and you know, because he's now retired from uh, the Marine Corps. But yeah, I mean, he brought her. He, he every time he PCS, like he brought. Her, and I don't know if it was a thousand, but you know, he was well known to bring along a lot of books, and you know, a lot of them were strategy books, military history books, but leadership books, etc. Um, and so, you know, when you read books, books change our lives. Books transform us. Um, not all of them, but certainly ones that are good and the ones that we read in the right moment and the right you know, season of life can have a transformational impact on our life story and, and how we think about ourselves and how we live our lives. So um, the idea of being well-read, you know, like leaders are readers, uh, absolutely true. I, I don't know how you can be a great leader when you're not investing in your own personal and professional development and growth. Yeah, and one of the beautiful quotes in the book you write, the nature of man has not changed, unfortunately, and it's not going to change anytime soon. How very, very wise. In the book also, you talk about emotional balance and sort of uh, working through that in perspective. You actually talk about a, uh, a person I've recently had on the podcast, which is uh, Pamela Slim. Uh, you talk about how she regains a sense of perspective during a family crisis in 2007 she's the author of two books or a few books escape from cubicle nation and body of work and she operates uh, her own executive coaching firm and she talks about when her husband sort of daryl got into a little bit financial trouble and she thought hey how do i get emotional balance go sit on a rock face the mountains can you talk about this particular story and sort of your relationship with pamela as well yeah absolutely yes yeah, so we've done we did some leadership work together back in probably 2015 and 16 uh, as I was leaving the army, but yeah, just such a simple, but again, probably three page story in the book, but so powerful. The idea of you feel the pressure and the stress, you know, like there's, this is during the housing, you know, you know, the crisis of 2008, um, you know, her husband was involved in construction, things were going very well. And all of a sudden they were not, you know, and you got all these stress and the financial cons, you know, the concerns and all that. And you can sit there and, and try to spin and try to get like, all right, what are we going to do? We're going to do and try to go immediately into problem solving mode. And she found it to be very useful to do the opposite of just slowing down. I think she had like had her morning coffee and just sit there and just kind of take it all in and just go breathe. Okay. Um, and let's, let's keep the perspective of this. This is not going to last forever. The bad luck is not going to last forever. Um, and we just need to be able to get through these tough times and then we'll be back. And sure enough, that that's exactly what happened. So again, this is the idea sometimes that we, we think that the best thing we can do is take action, right? I'm a, I'm a big bias for action person, uh, but sometimes, you know, the, the right action to take is to slow down or is to just be there, right? And give ourselves the time to really establish that emotional balance that we need before we go take the actual action that we that we are going to take. Yeah, well said. Um, in part four of the book, you talk about moral courage and you talk about a story about a guy named Frank M. Johnson Jr., who was appointed by Dwight Eisenhower to the federal district bench in Alabama as well. Talk about sort of the story about Frank Johnson and how he used moral courage to do things at the time that were very unpopular and what things did he do, if you remember? Yeah, I mean, yeah, so when you start talking about moral courage, that's so first important to kind of zoom out and really define moral courage. And Ray, my co-author, does a great job of this, you know, um, of it's not just the kind of courage when someone says like, I disagree with you or I think you're wrong, but it's often like, I think you're, you know, you're a bad person because of the stance that you're taking. And so in the, in the book, you know, we talk about Winston Churchill and Pope John Paul II standing up to communism um, and Martin Luther King Jr. Um, you know, and, and other people like examples, like we just talked about Judge Johnson, like, you know, especially in the South of the United States, um, you know, where there was still rampant, you know, uh, racial discrimination um, and uh, things taking place. I mean, he made, you know, decisions that were, you know, not popular with the majority of people, you know, and, and he knew, like, it doesn't matter, like, that the majority of the people do or don't, you know, agree with my decision. This is the right decision, you know? Uh, and so, again, having that moral courage and, again, it coming from, the, you know, from inward, from the soul, 
you know, from your strength or your faith in God or whatever your source of strength might be, um, it's, it's far greater and far stronger than other people there patting you on the back and telling you that you're doing the right thing. And so often what we see in an example like this is that moral courage takes on its best form, um, right? When most of the people around you disagree or telling you that you're a bad person, you know, um, and I think that's one of the biggest takeaways that we learn from this, you know, the interviews and, and these stories from history is that like, if you're going to make those hard unpopular decisions like he did, right. Uh, or like we saw from you know, Winston Churchill or Pope John Paul II, like, you had to have internal fortitude knowing that you were making the right decision because uh, it's far too easy and convenient to when people start to push back or fight back to say, oh, yeah, you're right, right? Uh, and then to change your mind, to stick with it and to have conviction, you, you got to really be able to have gone inward to do that analytical work and that soul work. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes people find the truth earlier than others as well or have an insight where they, they foresee what the future is going to be and sort of have to take that moral courage to say, you know what, this is my truth, this is what I believe in, and, you know, I'm going to bank on the future to say if I stick to, if I stick in my ground, you know, culture will change and, you know, the truth uh, will set us free. A lot of times we live under falsehoods and we need people like that with a strong conviction to say, no, 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 that's that's the wrong way uh, that is the wrong way, and this is the right way to move forward. But moving forward anyway to your second book, uh, Leadership is a Relationship, How to Put People First in the Digital World. You talk about, or can you talk to a little bit about, and you touched on it before, about how focus on health and wellness in this hybrid but increasing virtual slash metaverse world could be uh, interesting. So can you talk to a little bit about the book and how the times we're in at the moment, how we need to put people first uh, before uh, digital? Yeah, absolutely. So when you start thinking about um, so the book starts with, it started actually back in grad school when I was studying positive psychology and the importance of relationships, that especially leaders uh, that they build with the people that they lead uh, and, and how important and how critical that is. Um, you know, so it started way back in 2010 and then really kind of set it aside for a long period of time and, and dusted it off starting in 2019. I uh, worked with a different co-author on this book and um, you know, we talked about like, look, as the world very clearly and especially accelerated over the past couple of years with COVID, as the world has moved into more of this virtual, you know, and, and, and metaverse approach, you know, that, that we see taking, you know, really taking uh, stock um, and, and gaining traction. There's this fundamental question of like, is leadership about efficiency and always getting better outcomes or is it also about taking care of people? So in the military, we would, we would say this idea of like mission first, troops always. And so they both matter. Like the irony there is like one's first, one's always. Like you're basically saying both the mission and the, and the troops matter, right? They're, they're both like the most important things. You've got to accomplish the mission, but you also need to take care of your people. And uh, I think a lot of it is, is really like that thinking is what sits at the basis you know, of this book that as the world gets more virtual, are we as leaders going to continue to prioritize our relationships with people? Or is, are we going to allow work to really just become, you know, you know, truly transactional where we are just, Hey, yeah, you're doing your work. I'm doing my work. We're doing it. You're doing it here. I'm doing it there. And like, Hey, it's all about just getting the job done. Or are we really a team with camaraderie and we care for each other and we know each other and we anticipate each other's moves and we know how to support one another right? when, it, when things didn't go well or there's, you know, someone dropped the ball. All those kinds of things matter. And like, the observation is that increasingly, like, that is not how people are living. That is not how people are leading. And so the book really is, is, a, is, a, is an urge. It's a plea for leaders to, to know that as technology grows, as the, the metaverse and a more virtual world continues to accelerate, uh, that we need to be very conscious of our relationships and how we interact with people because at the core, that's still very much is what life is about. It's not just about making things more and more efficient. That's machines, right? You know, uh, and, the, and we are not machines. We're human beings with souls and with brains and with emotions and all the things that we have that makes us different than machines. And that we cannot forget that, you know, even though those might not be as efficient as a machine getting something done, that, it's, that life, life and leadership is not always about just getting the thing done as fast and efficiently as possible. Sometimes it's about the human beings involved in the ecosystem. Yeah, and you expand on that in the book as well. So I'll just read, so for thousands of years, our species evolved around close interactions with each other. Our ancestors studied each other's body language, tone, 
and energy to understand their social standing and the subtle uh, cultural information that was necessary for everyday survival. You also talk about sort of the richness of in-person interaction depends on innumerable factors we perceive from our companions' cadences, facial expressions, posture, smell, touch, and proximity. There's, uh, there's truth throughout the animal kingdom. In fact, we learn more about ourselves and our relatives in nature, we begin to build a more vibrant picture of the the marid methods animals for have for understanding each other. This is what we we don't want to sort of lose out in this new connected metaverse where we're just missing all those subtle subtle things that make us human as well. You talk about in sort of chapter one, moving on with accountability and the right amount of attention, and that uh, leadership is a choice. Can you talk about how sort of accountability? is sort of in care inspires us to grow rather than to fear negative consequences you talk about sort of directly confronting problems in a relationship can not only lead to discrete solutions but also create a deeper intimacy can you talk about sort of confronting problems with leadership for sure i mean when you think about again machines and ai and all that like when you when there's no emotions like you you are really about the efficiency and when you have human beings in the system there's going to be human error and humanness, which includes people being offended or people being upset or bothered or whatever it might be. And it's, I think, essential to know that as leaders that very often we might find the inclination or the pull to just not engage in the conflict and just pretend that it didn't happen and just hope that it's going to go away. And really, that's rarely the case. And so we make the case there really through a great profile of Olympian Carrie Walsh Jennings. Uh, you know, she has a great example you know, in there, you know, about just how powerful it is when we lean into the conflict and we view the conflict or the discussion that we're having with someone else, you know, uh, as a chance to grow and a chance to grow closer and better. And that when we hold each other accountable in a positive and constructive way, it makes the team better. It makes us better as individuals. Like it's, it's a big win all around. Right. And the other alternative is just to ignore it and pretend it didn't happen Right? So you avoid the conflict, but eventually it's going to come at the cost of a lot of things. And so it's a really great just perspective that you know, she shared with us about the value of leaning into that conflict um, and holding one another accountable when you're not bringing your very best effort or your best self to the table. Yeah, yeah, well said, well said. In the book as well, you talk about sort of mature accountability. How do we develop sort of mature accountability as a leader and what daily practices can we employ? Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, accountability is, first of all, like, like anything, the more you do it, the, the, the easier it gets, the better you get at it. Um, I think that, you know, having those conversations and, and those accountability discussions gets easier as we practice them. Um, I think it's also important to realize that, you know, they're, they're not necessarily enjoyable, right, for, for any, any uh, you or the person on, on the other end. Um, but I do think that, like, when we uh, engage in them daily, right? Or, or in obviously in many cases more than that, then that's, that's a big part of the equation. But it's also about how we approach it. This is not like a free pass to be like, well, hey, with all due respect, like, and then blah, 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 blah right? And then rip it into someone, right? Uh, this is really about how do you have the, the accountability conversation in a, in a thoughtful and productive way? Because words do matter and the words that you choose matter. And this is why some, a lot of people like, don't like getting in the conflict because as soon as they start to talk um, and their emotions take over, they don't, they don't say really what they wanted to say. And instead they say something else that's either more offensive or more insulting. And so the, their choice then is therefore is to like disengage in conflict or to send it in an email. Because at least in an email, you can get all your thoughts and all your words exactly right. Right. But I think that we as humans, it's important that we find whatever way we can best communicate and lean in and also give a little bit of grace to people when we're having a difficult conversation. They might say something that they didn't mean or that that we know it didn't come out quite right. Instead of holding that against them and, and using it as, well, you said this. It's like, no, no, no. He or she was like very frustrated in that moment when they said that. Let's get past that and get back to the core issue here. Right. Uh, I think those are just some things that I would I would share that I think are, are helpful perspectives uh, when thinking about how how to you know tackle this this challenge of accountability. Yeah, and one of the notes I got uh, in the book that was really great. You talk about sometimes the greatest exercise of power is the choice to forgive rather than punish. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So we have dedicated a whole big portion of the book to the power of forgiveness. Um, you know, forgiveness is hard. 
right? Depending on who you are, some people can find, find it very natural or very easy to forgive. There's some incredible examples of people who have forgiven somebody who killed their child or, you know, uh, but then there's some of us who can't let go um, when someone said something bad about us, you know, behind our back, you know? Um, and so the idea of when we start thinking about the application of this to leadership and to life, it's important to know that like everyone's going to make mistakes and because everyone makes mistakes, like you're going to need forgiveness. You're, you're going to need someone to forgive you at some point down the road and most likely before too long. And so it's, again, the idea of being authentic and not being hypocritical and saying, well, I want someone to forgive me when I make a mistake, but now you have made a mistake, right? You hurt my feelings and I'm not going to forgive, right? And so the idea of forgiveness is, is often the harder choice, but when we make it, uh, it has all kinds of profound impacts on our relationships and on our life. Um, you know, and there's finally, there's this, comp this concept of forgiveness of, you know, like is learning to let go, right? Even if someone doesn't say they're sorry, um, it's not holding on to the grudge, holding on to the, you know, to whoever offended you or did something right? that doesn't help us. You know, you know, it's just, it, it actually makes us more angry and it, and it holds us back. So learning to be able to move beyond people who've hurt us as well is also a really important skill, especially for our relationships with other people. Yeah. And we don't want to, we don't want to be carrying around that in our head and forgiveness allows us again, to get clear, get empty and basically uh, stay focused and stay on task as well. Moving on in the book, you talk about the power of sort of uh, resilience and that you talk, it's only when we're faced with obstacles, stress and other environmental threats that resilience or the lack of it emerges. Can you talk about sort of the power of sort of resilience and also having relationships as well to help us stay, you know, to help us get through um, these periods of sort of challenges and, and dark times? Absolutely. Relationships are essential to being resilient. There's often, I think, this concept of, you know, ah, you can just be really, really be really resilient, really hardy on your own. There are a select few people out there that have that capacity to do that. Right? They can, after a failure or a big mistake or a setback or a tragedy, like they can just get, you know, pick themselves back right up and, and, and keep moving forward. Um, honestly, those people probably more resemble, um, you know, machines or computers, right, than human beings, like in the way that they just can do that. Because most of us as human beings absolutely cannot. And we need the people in our ecosystem, our family, our friends, our teammates, our coworkers. We need those people to be there for us, to help pick us off the floor to you know, bring a meal over, to send flowers, to just sit down and have a conversation with, uh, especially when major adversity strikes. Now, again, adversity is such a sliding scale. It could be like, hey, I made a mistake and said something that I shouldn't have or that I didn't really mean. And then it could go on into you know, something further, you know, like, hey, we didn't hit our goal for the quarter or we made a big mistake. Um, you know, or it could be something tragic, like losing somebody close to you. Right? And so depending on where you're at on the scale, right, of adversity, like we need to tap into the power of resilience often in micro ways throughout the given day, but then also on a, on a, big, uh, on a big way. I think we do a lot of the smaller stuff on our own, right? Um, you know, and we don't necessarily need our relationships to kind of pull us through that. But once you get to that mid, mid size or that significant adversity, uh, resilience is really the product of the social support from the people that love us and the people that care about us to help us to pull through. Yeah, it's so important and, and we forget that, you know, we're surrounded by people who have, you know, real experiences, real fears as well and sort of segueing that into chapter eight, you talk about start leading with relationships and you talk about the power of fessing up to fear. Now, you're right, we're all scared sometimes, but admitting that we can feel risky. So admitting that we're scared can sometimes feel risky, but you talk about vulnerability can feel especially dangerous when you're scared. Can you talk about the power of sort of telling people, being vulnerable and saying, hey, I'm, I, I might be scared, but I'm going to do it anyway as well. Um, and at the end of the day, we're, we're all just people. So can you talk about the power of sort of vulnerability with, with leadership and, and building those relationships with other people? Absolutely. So that, that interview came from uh, actually a board member at Team Red, White and & Blue and now one of my friends, Coleman Ruiz, um, you know, former elite special operations uh, operator and you know a lot of this work he, you know that is you know, powerful around and vulnerability as you probably are aware of you know started from uh, Brene Brown you know in the work that she did you know well over a decade 15 years ago uh, since her big TED talk that she gave on this but you know vulnerability when it comes to leadership is is really interesting because uh, yeah you're going on something dangerous every single person's scared 
you know, and sitting there and pretending like no one is scared. When everyone looks around to the left and the right, it's like, no one's scared. Well, I'm scared. Uh, like, what does that make? Does that make me, uh, you know, a coward? Uh, you know, so it's really important, I think, you know, in these converse, you know, in these conversations that we have with people, especially like in things that involve in emotional intensity, like fear that, yeah, we like, we need to be, vul- we need to be vulnerable and, just, and be a little bit open with it. It doesn't mean you need to sit there and open up everything and say, oh, geez, I'm terrified. I'm so scared. What if we don't make it back? Like, you know, we don't want necessarily to do that, but opening up the conversation, uh, you know, in a productive way gives people like the ability of saying like, oh, okay, hey, you're scared? Yeah, me too. Let's go. We got this. And I remember when I'm on my first airborne operation jump that I was ever on, like, you know, the, the, the guy right to my neck, like looked at me like you could tell like, we were all nervous, right? Getting ready to jump out of an airplane from 1500 feet above the ground, you know, on a static line jump for the first time ever. And that everyone was kind of scared. He just like, we said, we got this, right? And like, and it was a matter of like, you could just tell like, we looked, we looked and saw in each other's eyes. Hey, yeah, we're all kind of scared right now because we don't know what this first jump is going to be like, but we can do this, right? So I think, again, go back to vulnerability. It does, it makes us human and it helps people feel more connected to us. Uh, there is a balance there, right? Like, you know, Brene Brown talks about this a lot, that not being too vulnerable, um, right? It doesn't mean just sharing everything uh, under the sun or all of our fears and concerns. But when we share some of our failures and mistakes we've made and some of our fears, it does make us more relatable and, and more uh you know, able to connect with the people around us. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Look, we could probably talk for another hour, but I think probably a good time to to wrap the podcast as well. Thank you for sharing the stories. Thank you for writing two amazing books and doing all the, the work uh, offline as well in, in your organizations and great work as well. Can you talk about where people can sort of find you, find the book? Is it your website or social? Yeah, where can people connect and, and purchase your books as well? Yeah, so you, yeah on social media, yep, LinkedIn and uh, Twitter, Irwin, RWB. Um, but also, yeah, uh, mikeirwin.net. Uh, but yeah, really, uh, you can just search the books, Lead Yourself First, and Leadership is Relationship, you know, wherever you buy books. But um, yeah, it, it's, been, uh, it's been a great conversation. We covered a lot of ground in terms of the books and some of the details of the books. And obviously, you know, the books go into much you know, greater detail, many more stories and all that. But hopefully people got a sampling, uh, you know, of some of the power of, of the discussion on, on these ideas. Yeah, absolutely. And just one final question as well. What, I'll do the Tim Ferriss one. If you had a billboard dedicated to one quote that you wanted the world to know, what would that quote be? You know, there was my, my mentor at the University of Michigan, Dr. Chris Peterson, you know, had this phrase and he would conclude all of his talks on positive psychology. And he traveled all around the world and gave these talks. And, and he summed it up by saying, other people matter, period. Anything you do that can and builds relationships in and among people is going to make you happy. So my billboard would be other people matter, right? The reminder that, you know, our life is not really about us. It's about others. Um, When we live selfishly, we only get so much joy. We only get so much satisfaction out of it. We might get a lot of success, but uh, I know a lot of really miserable people, you know, who don't think about others and who don't prioritize you know, the other people in their lives, the relationships, but also the people who work with them and for them. So it's really the idea that other people matter. Yeah, absolutely. And one of my, my highest value is people. And one of my quotes is people have everything you need. People are superior to everything as well. So the more you focus on people, you'll get everything else that comes with it too. But Mike, thank you for being a guest on the Best Book Bits podcast. Yeah, thank you for sharing your stories and thank you for writing two great books. To my audience out there, go follow Mike, buy his books, consume his content and uh, follow him on social. So Mike, thanks again for being on the show and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, Michael. I appreciate it. Thank you.